This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. Since this is the first time that you've been on The Melt, uh, maybe you could tell the people watching and listening a little bit about your background and maybe what brought you to these issues, the trans issues. Well, that's a, a, a long story, so cut me, you know, hurry me <laughs> up when you need to. Take but, your time. Um, when I was a kid, I had a very intense experience. It started as a very young kid, like as far back as I go, so when I was about three, Mm -hmm. And I now know I had what would now be called classic childhood onset gender dysphoria, that that is the diagnosis that today would be given to a child like me. Of course, Mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time. At the time, I wanted to be a boy and I thought I should be a boy. And I presented like a boy and I did for many years. And, you know, in my own way, when you're three and four and five, you're kind of very comfortable doing whatever you want to do. You know what I mean? And then as life goes on, I'm trying to remember back because it was a long time ago. Um, But as life went on, there's a kind of a dawning realisation. Now, it's going to be rough around the ages, but maybe six, seven, eight, nine. You're starting to realise people are, certainly by eight and nine, people are pandering to me. They know I'm not a boy. Yes. They're letting on that they pretend that I'm a boy, if you follow yeah. me. So mm-hmm. that was pretty, that made me feel outraged and very angry. I didn't feel thankful, which is what I should have felt. <laughs> I felt like, I felt embarrassed and outraged and I was going to prove to them. You know what I mean? I kind of, and I liked the power. I, I remember at the time I was, I was very kind of full of, of myself of being a boy and you know I was good at it I was I was very male in my ways I, I was a good fighter and I was good at being brave and having the doing the sports and stuff like that I was very comfortable in it and everybody else was too <laughs> around me they let me be nobody brought me to a psychiatrist nobody did anything it was a very different time I was in Dublin 70s 80s nobody was bringing anybody to a psychiatrist in my world and it was fine and then puberty came eventually and that was really difficult. It was actually very harrowing. It was a horrible experience. You know, puberty lasts a few years and it was horrible. I was very lonely and very isolated. And I certainly, I was a misogynist at the time. I did not want to be a girl or a woman. I thought girlish was an insult. Like, you know, and I really, really was not happy with the way I was ashamed and it was horrible. But life went on. I became a, a, a teenager, adolescent, and I ultimately became a woman and ultimately became comfortable in my own skin and became happy to be a woman eventually. And years later became a mother. And actually it was, you know, the, the, the most important thing to me. So I'm very glad I didn't transition. I'm very glad I wasn't given the option to transition. Now I'm very well aware that for some people, that feeling that I had doesn't seem to go away. It mm-hmm. maintains. And, um, you know, that that's life, you know, the way lots of different mm-hmm. things, some things stick and some things don't. And so I, um, whenever I would meet somebody who had transitioned in my adulthood, I would think, oh, they got stuck in that mindset that I was in. Yeah, exactly. That I'd been in for many years, but I ultimately got out of, they got stuck in. And that's all I would think, you know, not much more than that, but a kind of a slight interest to it. And then I became a psychotherapist in my 30s and I was writing books. I've written a few books on parenting and mental health and things like that. And a book was coming out on bullying and I I kind of I was noticing that trans issues was becoming more and more common. It was just in the media. This is 2017. It was just in the media a lot. 
And I thought, I'm not seeing anybody writing my story. Like, where of all these stories that were coming out about trans issues, I just wasn't seeing anybody who was saying, I was a very, because I was a very strange, eccentric kid. I remember somebody meeting me years later, and he looked at me and he said, you were the oddest kid. <laughs> and he really meant it. Like, I was very <laughs> odd. I was so extreme. Uh, you know what I mean? And he meant it in a nice way, but like, you were very strange. <laughs> And, you know, anybody who remembers me would say, yeah, she was very eccentric, very heavily into the boy thing. And um, so nobody was writing my story. So I thought I often wrote for the I'm from Ireland, often wrote for the national media about different issues. So I thought, well, I'll write an article about this, aware that it was kind of incendiary, aware that like trans issues just seem to be very heightened, but not more than that I was just you know when I wrote the article which was basically I had a very intense experience for many years I wonder if any of these kids who were coming out of trans could be like me sure and as a result I was asked to do a film for Channel 4 uh, Channel 4 is a British broadcasting TV station and we did a film called When Kids, kids Say They're Trans mm -hmm. and When Kids Say They're Trans was a film basically saying of the 4,000% a rise in children seeking medical transition could any of them be like me and if they are could those kids be better off if we let them be let, you know what I mean allowed them to become the man or the woman that they they are rather than presuming that they should all medicalize and go on an irreversible path mm -hmm. and a different adulthood and um, the film was an extraordinary experience that was 2018 it was an extraordinary experience for me because to be honest, I'd, I'd never encountered such a world. There was so many dirty tricks, so many attempts to close us down. Lies were said about me that I was transphobic. And I was like, but I, I've literally never spoken about it. I've spoken about bullying and anxiety and mental health and parenting and <laughs> everybody. You know, how could you call me transphobic? They, were, they, they kind of did quite an extensive campaign to get the film shut down. Then there was a kind of a meeting with kind of women's rights feminists and they uh, tried to attack the building. They, they came in to try and attack the, the, the recording equipment. This is very expensive TV wow. equipment to try and stop the meeting. They attacked the equipment and they had a smoke bomb. It was, it, there was, a, it was just an extraordinary world that I was like, what is going on? This is 2018 when many of us weren't quite aware. And it was over in England. I was ringing my husband going, this is the maddest world. This is just a mad, mad world. And I suppose as the year went on, I realised that I have quite some quite very fundamental liberal values that really mean a lot to me. And one of them is the, the freedom for somebody to speak freely. Like, I think, I think it's really, really important. I think Absolutely. it's the bedrock of civilization. I really sure. do. I think without free speech, you can't think. And without free speech, things go underground. Yes. And for those two reasons, we've got to give people, even if you massively disagree with them, the freedom to speak. Absolutely. And um, so after the film, I, I was incredibly engaged with this issue. I tried to go back to my general psychotherapy. I released a book on anxiety, tried to say, OK, well, I did my bit and I'll move on. But I was just emailed all the time by different people, people who had transitioned, who regretted it and said I was like you, people who had detransitioned that means they transitioned and they'd gone back yeah. people who had uh, children who were like me and they didn't know what to do with the kid mm -hmm. people who were very worried about their child who had transitioned and who wasn't doing well and so because I was swamped by emails I started to kind of re-engage with this world even though I tried to get out of it and just go into, back into my normal life I wasn't able I really wasn't able I'd never experienced such an in inundation of, of emails and so as a result I started an organization called the Gender Dysphoria Support Network. I started it in March 2020 because of Covid. Remember mm. Covid everything closed down and suddenly we had free time that we didn't expect. Yes. So because I suddenly because I give a lot of talks you won't be surprised <laughs> I give a lot of talks <laughs> but um, yeah because Covid happened I suddenly had free time and so I could answer all these parents I had free time, I had enough time to say, well, okay, I'll run a few online meetings with you parents who seem to be so worried and you're gathering in numbers 
and we'll see how it goes. Like I was kind of thinking the likes of Al Anon. So AA is for alcoholism and yes. Al Anon is for the families of alcoholics. So I was thinking mm-hmm. of this. This is for the parents who are very distressed about their children. So I thought, you know, we're no, no great plan here. Just give them support. Yeah. And when I started that, that was as bizarre as when I started the film because I came across this network of thousands of parents who were utterly devastated. And these were loving, engaged, mostly left-wing parents who were very, very, very liberal and just couldn't understand what was going on. They were like, I'm liberal. They always would say, I believe in gay marriage. I've no problem with any of this. They were very determined because they felt that they were being told that they were transphobic all the time. You know what I mean? It was a big kind of hammer to be hitting people with. And their children were almost invariably neurodiverse, uh, like autism, ADHD, anxiety, eating disorders as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Lots of mental health trouble, a lot of trauma. These were really vulnerable kids. These were not the savvy popular kids. These Mm -hmm. weren't cool kids with mates. These were lost, lonely kids in their bedrooms on their own, finding a community online and finding a different escape from their unhappiness. Again and again and again, every single parent was describing really disturbed, upset kids. And I was like, what have I come across? I knew it was bad. I had no idea the number. So it was going to be one meeting a week. It immediately turned into two weeks, two meetings a week, three meetings a week, four meetings a week, five meetings. It went so fast. It went so big. And I was like, what is going on? So a year later, because I realized I'd stumbled upon an absolute minefield, I set up an organization called Genspect. And Genspect was the idea was to promote this issue, to offer a kind of a voice for parents, but also an approach that offers a a healthy approach to sex and gender, because I think we'd lost our way. That, you know, people who who were just worried about their children taking long term medical decisions were suddenly being called right wing transphobic Christian zealot bigots and it was so random it was like what sorry what, what has that got to do with right wing leverage exactly. what's that got to do with anything what are you talking about so because all of that happened we started Genspect in 2021 the summer and I think we started the podcast myself and Sasha I had around about then I'm kind of getting mixing up all my years I think it might have been 2021 when we started and the, the idea of the podcast was very similar to the idea of the organization, which was just to offer a thoughtful approach to sex and gender and these issues that people are confronting just in a non-judgmental way so that we could tease out the issues. And, you know, it's it's gone very well. It's gone from being a small podcast and a small organization to being very big in these three years. Frighteningly big and I'm overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't think it would be anything like as big as it is. But it it's it's meeting a really dire need. It's and sure. that that's what's happening. So that was my very long answer. Oh no, no, we like long answers here. Did you <laughs> something that you wanted to before I go into something else? No, go for it. Oh, okay. Uh, are there any tangible reasons that uh, people um, suffer? I guess, for lack of a better term, gender dysphoria. Is it a is it a psychological reason? Is it a physiological? Is it a combo of lots of different things depending on the context? Is there anything to point to or does it just seem to come out of nowhere? It's a brilliant question because we don't know, you know. we don't. Why did I, at three, suddenly decide to want yeah. to become a boy, you know? Mm-hmm. My reading, but I, nobody knows, there's no research, there's no, um, there's no test that you could give me a blood test at three or a DNA test or a, you couldn't give me an X-ray and figure out why I am, even an MRI, you know what I mean? You won't see anything. All you'll see is, like, I might do traits that are related to male activity, but it, it doesn't give any reason why I did this. Because I had a, an older sister and an older brother. You know, I had a mother who was, um, in one level, you could say very gender non-conforming because she was very, very sporty. Um, but in another way, she was quite gentle. So, you know, she was the both. You know, I don't know. There was no reason. I would say I was a very unhappy kid and I was in a very unhappy family and it was a very difficult childhood. So to me, it makes sense that I was a kid who was unhappy, looked around and thought, that's where the power is. I'm going over there. Now, that's 45 years later. We you know, turning me into a three-year-old Freud who knew what to do. 
I don't know why, but I do know it was all consuming and completely it, was, it just was me for those mm-hmm. years. It was very yeah. very tangible it felt because a lot of people these days say it doesn't exist. And I'm like I I don't even know what you mean. Like I was 3. Like what the- do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like kind of saying almost anorexia or depression doesn't is. It's like you know it. it, it, it well, they exist for the person who's deep in it. Like, does anorexia exist? I, I don't know. It doesn't. Mightn't change anything in the brain, but people can die from this because they're. You know that phrase. You know the mind can make a heaven out of hell and a hell out of heaven. Where the mind could go, it has such a capacity to go to extraordinary places. Absolutely. So. As a psychotherapist, I naturally go towards the psychological understanding. Other people, and now I give a lot of talks around gender, and I often ask, what do people think? And mostly hands go up for some sort of biological understanding, some sort of biology. People always make noises around, oh, maybe when you were in your mother's womb, she ate something straight to the mother. (laughs) (laughs) But um, they've never, ever found it. And that's where I'd go back to. Do you remember earlier I said some people might get stuck and I I saw people getting stuck in trans issues as such and I didn't. I thankfully moved on. I would see, you know, I've met people who had OCD since they were six. I've had people who've had panic since they were very young. I've had people who say that their eating disorder is an integral part of them. Mm -hmm. You know, anxiety. So you can get stuck in any mental health issue at a very young age and you can have it for life. And that doesn't make it less of a psychological issue. Sure. While other people would say, no, sure, I've had it for 45 years. It's clearly biological. And I'm like, nah, not, not if you've worked in psychology. It just doesn't stem. No, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. The fact is people can have it for many, 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 many years. And it doesn't mean it's biological. Having said that, I hold out and hu- humbly bow to the fact that I don't know everything. Science is only starting and for all we know, we'll find. So I generally have a biopsychosocial view of it, which is there could be a biological component that we don't know about. We mm-hmm. certainly never found it. I certainly believe there's a psychological component. I very definitely think. And there could be a sociological. There could be social issues. You know, I, I, I think it's interesting, the impact of society. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. I also think it's interesting, by the way, that if you look at the history you'll see that there was always very girlish boys going back to ancient Greek times. And they very often were gay. An awful lot of those boys turned out to be gay. I haven't figured out why is that, though? Why do girlish boys turn out to be gay? Some people think that's a really obvious question, but I've, I've never really had a satisfactory answer for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and not so much with girls, but certainly a proportion of girls who are very boyish end up being lesbian. So that indicates something. For sure. Yeah, I don't know if I have much faith in science figuring it out. The science seems so skewed these days. Science seems so susceptible to political yeah. motivations, ideological motivations. Like, I don't know if I really trust it to be objection. Uh, uh, what's the objective. word? Objective. Objective, yes. Yeah. 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 It, seem, it seems to be pretty emotional right now, the science. I, I couldn't agree more with you. You remember people used to say, I trust the science. And it's like, ooh. You're mad. (laughs) I don't know. Science has lost an awful lot of credibility. It used to be such a sober, serious. And then all these crazy, you know, research would come out like, you know, 85 percent of people like tables in the middle of the room. And the next day you'd look at the newspaper, 84 percent of people like tables in the corner. And you're like, what is this? There's research for everything. (laughs) It it contradicts itself and it's ridiculous. So I think... The science has been, as far as I can see, and as far as what you seem to be saying, it seems to have been corrupted by who's who's paying for this research. Yes, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, what, I mean, what do you think got this snowball rolling in the first place? Was it just a perfect storm of social media and? Uh, I know. Being like inclusive to a to a fault almost. Huh. Um. Yeah, that's a. Big question. Like, you know, when you trace it back, and I have traced it back, um, you realise there was always girlish boys. Way back in thousands of years ago, they were they were very sexualized. those boys. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They, were, they really were from a very young age. So there was that happening. 
Then you look at there wasn't much contact, much talk about boyish girls, but they did exist. There was a kind of an almost heyday of boyish girls with the literature. If you look at like you know, Little Women, Joe mm. Marsh was was an extraordinarily, you know, boyish character. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a few different characters, you know, um, Scout and To Kill a Mockingbird, and you know the famous five. You might know it, but it was a huge. Yeah, over here and George and the famous five and the few people in literature that made a real kind of affection towards these boyish intense girls do you know what I mean it's interesting that they're always very intense and a little bit furious because that's what I was <laughs> and shoving it down everybody's throat you know what I mean so it's funny I remember a psychologist who works in this field for decades and he said when it's childhood onset the town knows about it and I thought that was me. <laughs> Proclaimed. And uh-huh. what's interesting that that has happened in, in the last decade, very suddenly, and it's never before been seen in the medical literature, a new cohort has arrived, and that's the teenage onset. So there was, there was never, there was only ever childhood onset and middle-aged male onset, and I'll go back to that in a sec. But they were the two groups, and the other groups weren't say, seen. And usually those childhood onset, frankly, the girls were considered cute and kind of ignored, and the boys were considered gay. That's what they were considered. And homophobic parents would bring them to clinics saying, sort out my son. So Mm. much more, this is my interpretation, but I think it's quite a good one. So much more boys presented at those clinics. There was way more boys in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who were sent to clinics saying, he's girlish, there's a problem. Mm. Yeah. Now, if you look at the literature and if you look at, there's a great book called Tomboy by Lisa Selen Davis and she gives an analysis of the tomboy. Even if you think about it, the word tomboy, it's very affectionate. It makes people smile. You know what I mean? And it has its own name. And the key point is the word boy. If that had been Tom Girl, I wouldn't have had anything to do with it. It was Tom <laughs> Boy. So that was perfectly fine. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And uh, funny enough, when I was a kid, I was always asked, are you a boy or a girl? Everywhere I went. And I'd, I'd kind of answer a boy. And then sometimes I'd answer no, which was like, what, what was I, non-binary or something? I don't know. But um, yeah, those kids always existed. And then you asked, like, where did all this come from? So those kids always existed. Mm-hmm. And there was different responses to the boys and to the girls. Sure. And then critical theory came into the world in and around the 80s and 90s, where they basically said everything you know is wrong and mm-hmm. truth is subjective. And, you know, it's it's kind of oppressive to take uh, knowledge as uh, uh, the facts. Mm-hmm. Because everything was arguable. And queer theory came... What did you say? Postmodernism. Yeah, postmodernism came along. And with that came queer theory. And queer theory argued that heteronormativity, as in the straight man and the straight woman having children, is oppressive. And we needed to queer things. Mm -hmm. And so you'd queer, you know, that, you know, so the idea would be to kind of bring in more kind of um, different kind of models, maybe polyamory or maybe uh, lots of different ways to kind of have a family. But they'd be against the family as a concept. Queer theory would say, nah, why why do you need a family? You know what I mean? So there was that was kind of coming up through the from the the ivory towers of academia, but it was Mm -hmm. coming through. At the same time, there was this kind of extraordinary theory that was kind of a crank theory in the twenties and thirties, in nineteen twenties and thirties. It wasn't taken seriously. It became a theory in the nineteen fifties and sixties by this guy called John Money, and he was a very, very, very unethical individual who yes. kind of operated on children who'd been born with intersex conditions. Mm-hmm. These intersex conditions are basically your genitals might not be fully formed or they might have issues. And sometimes they, the child, because of the issues with the genitals, will be you know, raised as the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. And then it would emerge that they were actually a boy or a girl. And, you know, it's, it's a very difficult condition for some children, not for others. You know what I mean? It's a, it depends on the kid and it depends on the level and it depends on the there's about 42 different conditions that are intersex conditions. Some are very mm-hmm. difficult and some aren't, if you follow me. So I know somebody who was born without a womb and she's technically, she's got MRKH, which is a type of intersex condition. But it's not 
as devastating as having me- genitals that you couldn't actually recognize if you follow me mm-hmm. it's hard yeah. but it's it's not as difficult john money was a doctor in johns hopkins uh university hospital and he uh had this crackpot theory that if a child was got at before they were two you could raise them in either sex it didn't matter so you just had to assign them a sex so when he heard about a little boy who was uh, who'd had a terrible botched operation. It was a circumcision operation. But um, when he was 10 months old, he said, we can raise him as a boy. It doesn't matter. We just need to change his name and raise him as a boy. And this little boy was raised as a boy as a result of a botched operation. And it was an utter disaster. And he needed to be a boy. He acted like a boy all throughout his childhood. He didn't know he was a boy. He became but very, he very... Being, dis- he, yeah. he was being raised as a girl. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good spot, <Yeah>. Hunter. <laughs> so he was born as a boy. He'd had a botched operation at 10 months. His parents went to Johns Hopkins saying, can you help me? And crackpot John Money said, I can. We can raise this child as a girl. They mm-hmm. raised the poor kid as a girl. The, the kid didn't know that he was really a boy. Raised as a girl, told he was a girl. It wasn't told until he was 14. And he was the most miserable kid who would not go back to John Money. And there's a lot of kind of accusations that there was an awful lot of sexual inappropriate behaviour between John Money and children like himself. And uh, then he was told at 14, you were actually born a boy. And the poor kid, because his only question was, what was my name? Oh, please, Louise. Yeah. Anyway, that guy, John Money's theory, gender identity, it wasn't only him, Bob Stoller, Robert Stoller also had that theory that there was an identity within you and it's called gender identity theory. And mm-hmm. if you have that identity within you and it doesn't matter, match your body, that means you should change your body to match your gender identity. And so he had this theory that we have, it's like a soul. So mm-hmm. it, my mother believes, she's a Catholic and I was born a Catholic and she believes that I have a soul. And I could say to her, I don't think I have a soul. And she'd say, well, you do. <laughs> you do and you just don't know so that you know we managed to jog along like she thinks one thing and I think the other and that's sure. perfectly fine with me you know and um she might be right you know I, I'm very agnostic in 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 this type of thing mm-hmm. and um the gender identity theory is very like that because it kind of says you've got every one of us here Chris you have a male soul and male gender identity Hunter you have a female I have a female and if it's not matched, you should change your body to shape, to, mm-hmm. to kind of represent that soul. And if it's not matched, it will cause you more pain than anything known to man. And we should always help everybody whose gender identity doesn't match to medically transition as fast as possible. And I'm like, yeah, well, what about me, who had clearly a gender identity that was very male for many years and then didn't? So mm-hmm. where do I fit in and all that? So that theory particularly irks me because it doesn't fit with me and mm-hmm. then that theory it didn't really not it was a, it was a fringe theory that didn't really go anywhere and then arrived in with queer theory in the last 10 20 years where there's this you can be anything you want along with that there's been a huge diagnosis creep where people are getting diagnosed with all sorts of things a lot easier along yes. with that they've moved to kind of patient advocacy and so the patient kind of says like when I, you know, when I first started psychotherapist, they would act as if I was the expert and they'd come in to me. But now they come in and tell me, I think I'd like about 12 sessions of CBT and I'd like you to focus on and I'm like, really? That's nice. <laughs> what I offer is a therapeutic process. And, you and know what, what is mean? my rate? So, what? And what is my rate while you're at it? How much are you paying me to do? <laughs> Where will we do this? Yeah, so th- there's been a real rise in patient, self-patient advocacy so that a lot of patients, because of Google, you know, you could argue, they come in and tell the doctor what they want, what's yes. wrong with them, and how yeah. they see the treatment. So this is a perfect storm of a lot of different things that are happening. Sure. Along with that came social media and social contagion has always existed among teenage girls there's been so many examples in history it's fascinating but it's always existed Mm -hmm. and along with that came if you think about it since the 90s there was an intense pressure on girls to be incredibly pretty to be uh, that whole you know the pink 
you know, baby girl, what do you call it? The onesie, the pink onesie and the blue onesie, the pink pram and the blue pram, the pink cotton, the blue, everyone went pink and blue, pink and blue in the 19, early 1990s and it exploded because they were making more money. You know what I mean? So there's a huge amount of emphasis on girls being very pretty and boys being very boyish. All kind of under pseudo were so kind of free, but there was a hell of a lot of emphasis on looks. And I would say there's a small section of kids who hate that emphasis on pink and blue birthday cards and birthday cakes and all that. It's very interesting. The first child who was uh, the kind of subject of a gender reveal. So the Time magazine were, you know, studying the concept of, you know, gender reveal parties where the parents. Yes, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. It's a, boo, yeah. it's a blue, it's a, it's a blue, mm-hmm. it's a baby, it's a whatever, you know what I mean? And so the cake might be blue and that means it's a, boy that's going to be uh, birthed in a few months or if the Mm -hmm. cake is pink it's a girl or whatever Mm -hmm. and the first reporting of that in Time magazine the kid was uh, pink it was a girl and uh, because of course pink is girl and uh, that was in 2008 and that kid has come out as non-binary and I'm like yeah no wonder you stuff you stuff pink and blue down children's throats too much and some of them will just say nope yeah, exactly. No, thank you. Yes. And so this extraordinary contagion that's happened, and I believe it is a contagion that's happened, has happened since the kind of really the arrival of the smartphone and smart and social media. 2012, you know, is, is really the when it started to really gain pace. 2015, it accelerated in all our lives. And the social contagion has been phenomenal. And suddenly, out of nowhere, a new cohort never before seen seen in the medical literature Teenage girls were presenting at gender identity clinics in numbers that way surpassed any other medical literature in this history. And so before, just to finish, before there was always a small number of boys, which were arguably from homophobic parents, but we don't know that, but arguably. Mm -hmm. And there was always middle-aged males. And there's a whole new kind of understanding of those middle-aged males that they'd, they'd always existed in a way they were the people who were medically transitioning in previous decades these middle-aged males who suddenly decided to be women and we mm-hmm. saw them i think we're all old enough to remember the kind mm-hmm. of oprah winfrey Geraldo style talk shows where the man mm-hmm. would say so i was really a woman and i had terrible mm-hmm. pain and we yeah. used to watch the talk shows going oh that seems very sad and very strange, but generally we'd, there'd be a wife beside them and we'd think, that poor wife. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you marry one person and you don't expect them to suddenly become a different person. I now know, now that I've been completely immersed in the literature, I now know that actually there's a condition called autogynephilia, which is an erotic mm-hmm. fixation on mm-hmm. viewing yourself as a woman. Yeah. And middle-aged males, a very small number, would be the people who are medically transitioning who are seeking that. They, they it, This is a, a, a very definitely a paraphilia. There's not that many paraphilias in life. You know, one of them would be uh, voyeurism. One of them mm-hmm. would be exhibitionism. One of them mm-hmm. would be, you know, paedophilia. Like, they're all different paraphilias. And when they are, they're very compulsive. So no matter how often a voyeur is caught or an exhibitionist is caught in the woods, mm-hmm. he still goes out and does it again. So mm-hmm. the compulsion on, in these people with these paraphilias is really strong. And autogynephilia is a paraphilia. It's also a compulsion. And they, it doesn't let up. And those males just become obsessed with the idea of medical transition. And so they were a completely different cohort. So now we've got three cohorts, the children, the teenagers, and mm-hmm. then the autogynophiles who are generally kind of midlife, that they finally, they might have been dressing up as women all their life, mm-hmm. but they finally said, that's it, I'm going, I'm crossing the Rubicon, I'm becoming a woman. Why it happens in midlife, I don't think we've studied. This is massively understudied condition, but it could be that finally I'm, I'm doing it. It could also be like, you know, now the medical science is there or they're brave enough or they're rich enough. There could be lots of different reasons. Sure. So why, I'm telling you, we could talk for hours about why, but there's a good few reasons why it's become so big at the moment. Yeah, I I think that, that uh, the men that fall in that last category, I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying about this obsession with beauty. And I think that a lot of this is attention getting from the outset of wanting, like seeing someone on social media or in the, 
you know, you look at back at the, to Marilyn Monroe, for example. This, these are women who are highly lauded based on one very specific criteria, their looks. And when you see the amount of attention that someone is getting based on that one criteria, it can seem very alluring. Like, oh, well, I want that type of attention. So it's easy to assume that the costume that is a woman is what it means to be a woman. So I think that that category, that autogynephilia, is really based on these very surface um, definitions of femininity. You don't see anyone that's trying to look like Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> wait, wait, I will <laughs> argue with you. There's, you. there's different types of autogynephiles, and yes, some of them are the Marilyn Monroe, very sexualized but there's a yes. whole other section which are astonishingly like Margaret Thatcher. That's no. their, yeah, that's their kick. I know. Like you, Edith now Bunker. I've said it, you'll start <laughs> noticing it. And you'll well, remember and they're this. not getting as much airtime as like these highly sexualized no, versions. Because there's something incredibly almost offensive about the really sexualized, you know, mm. and it does feel like this is sex out of control now. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? While the ones who are dressing up in this, like, Victoriana, still woman face, may I say, version <laughs> of woman, um, it's not as provocative or as, as offensive. But they're there. Now I've said it. Wait till you see. You'll all spot it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But they're not half as, yeah. The other ones, it's just, it's so sexualized. It's like, it's an, in, the, the, the implicit kind of understanding is you see women as just sex objects. Mm-hmm. And isn't that fascinating that that feminists have not stood up against this and then they haven't said women are way more than just the sum of their parts. Like we have so much more to offer than our bodies or our makeup or the the way we present ourselves. The performative. Yeah, it seems like that would be like a feminist uh, uh, torch to carry to yeah. want to be able to defend women you mean well, there was, this this arrived in quite a big deal in the 1960s and 70s in feminism feminism movement it was the kind of second wave feminists and they were you know they were doing great things we'd already got through the suffragettes we had the vote and they were you know looking for you know recognition in the workplace and things like that and um it divided the feminist movement so the liberal feminists said we should welcome in these trans women they're just like women Mm-hmm. And the radical feminists said, no, these are men performing women, womanhood and we should not let them in. And it's quite interesting when you look at the, one of the first splits, the trans woman who arrived in, frankly, in a very male way, ended up becoming president of the society very fast, yeah. <laughs> caused war and didn't, didn't do what most women would do, which is I'll back out, I'm causing too much trouble. No, no, he sat there saying, fight it out. <laughs> I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm not budging. <laughs> it's wild. It is wild. And it has badly split the feminist movement. It's badly. So you have to figure out, is this a liberal feminist or a radical feminist? There's lots of other types of feminists. But a quick rule of thumb, liberal feminists will say, welcome trans women. They are our sisters. They are women. Rad feminists would say, no, they're not. And they should not be in women's spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think was going on with the shop, te- the Canadian shop teacher with the huge prosthetic breasts? Right. I'm yeah, glad you that- asked that. In yeah, a way, yeah. it was such a shocking. Sho- I hope you put up a picture when we put it out. Like you know, there's mm-hmm. such a shocking, shocking image, and I think it was abusive for the children. I think it was oh, really, yeah. really Absolutely. abusive. If my little boy, you know, he, you know, he's such an innocent, he's 14, but, you know, he's just a, an innocent. If he had been, I would have, I would have picketed the school. I, I can't believe the parents sat by and watched yeah. that unfold. But this was somebody who had escalated their autogynephilia beyond any sort of bounds of control. So, you know, the way I talked about the exhibitionist who just can't stop. Or same mm-hmm. with the paedophile, and they just can't stop, and they end up in prison because they are not stopping. They keep on just reoffending, reoffending. Mm-hmm. So to me, what had happened with that person, it was quite clearly autogynephilia that was completely out of control. He had lost that person had lost all sense of 
uh, decorum and um, appropriateness. And while, frankly, men in history, and it's mostly men, have who have these extreme sexual conditions, they, they've always existed. Society has generally protected women mm-hmm. and children from them with various things like putting them in jail or whatever, you know what I mean, doing various things to, to try and put some hold onto it. But the weird world we live in now thought that it was appropriate for this person to continue to teach children. And there was an even, there was an awful lot of, the, the filming of that, person with these massive breasts he was he was cutting woodwork right he, he was cutting wood mm-hmm. and there was a, a, a blade very near it and anybody who knows and I've studied it anybody who knows the kind of the videos around this there's a lot of kind of weird um sexual activity around kind of pain and s and bdsm and stuff like that you just thought oh man that person is just so deep in sexual disorder he shouldn't be anywhere near children or a school anywhere near it and shame on the authorities i saw he left that job and then he got a job somewhere else somebody actually employed him i i just think it's i think canada has lost its mind i really do and I think it's a really sad, and I think those kids will not know what to make of what happened there. And some of them will have been turned on. It's very easy for boys to get turned on despite themselves, even though they don't even like it. Yeah. it so many strange things will have happened in that school, and I just think it was an absolute... We're going to remember that in history. It's going to go back to, look at this. This is what they were doing in 2022 or three or whatever it was. And we'll there will be acknowledgement that we'd lost our minds on this. Well, I think in, you know, in that case, it, I would consider that similar to like a Harvey Weinstein okay. situation where the pathology is that this person's getting off on the horror. They are getting off on the, on the fact that they are repulsing people. And that's part of the, uh, the fetishizing of looking so outrageous so with weinstein he could have had sex with any woman there were women all over the world who would have readily had sex with him as repulsive as he may have been physically he still was a powerful man he had a lot of money there was plenty of takers but what he was getting off on is being with the woman who doesn't want to be with him that is the 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 uh they're not hook that's the that's the the fetish is the horror of seeing someone freaking out and being revulsed by your physical presence and i think that this man in in canada was doing the same exact thing like he knew he was horrifying these kids and there's a power dynamic that is being exchanged there so the kids are being traumatized and he's getting off on that yeah. And basically the community is just supporting him because no one wants to be considered phobic in any regard whatsoever. Yeah, which is funny because I often think if we're going to go for phobic, well, why not have some compassion for the people with phobias? Like, (laughs) (laughs) if we're going to go that way. (laughs) But you're right. What you said is so key. And I I missed it when I was describing autogonophilia. The, the, you know, the, some of these men with autogonophilia really part of part of their paraphilia is being humiliated, is disgusting other people. That is part of it. I remember when I was in my 20s, I had a clothes shop. This before I became a psychotherapist. I became a therapist in my 30s and I had a clothes shop and I was, you know, every day I was on my own. It's a small shop, you know, and every day um, I'd be on my own working or whoever would be working would be on their own. It wasn't two man shop. It was a one man shop like and um, there was this period of time where this guy used to come in and he used to dress in to go into the dressing room and try on dresses and come out. And I could see his erection and he knew I could see his erection. Mm-hmm. And I was a woman in my early 20s looking away, not quite knowing what to do. And he'd be giving me these weird, you know, that sex 
face. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know when somebody is in the middle of kind of some sort of sexual thing. He'd be giving yeah. me the, and I, I never knew what to do because I was just, I had no idea about autogenophilia. I didn't know anything about any of this. So all I mm -hmm. knew was I dreaded this guy coming in. And then an old friend was having a coffee with me in the shop. She was coming another day, you know, and she came in and she, we were having a coffee and having a chat and who arrives in but me boyo. And I was like, oh, God, here he comes. <laughs> and he went in and he did the usual, tried on the dress. And the look in my friend's face, the look of revulsion and kind of, oh, my God, what is that guy doing? <laughs> and that emboldened me to realise because it's, 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 it's like, you know, the frogs getting hotter when in the boiling mm -hmm. water. Yes. He had done it step by step with me. We were months into this process mm -hmm. and I suddenly realized I was uh, an unconsenting, a non-consenting part of his sex act mm -hmm. regularly. Yeah. And he was doing it to me. And from that day forth, I realized, chill him out, get him the out. Like, ugh. Yeah. you know what I mean? No more. So I completely changed my kind of kind of slightly horrified, put my head down, or do you want, I wasn't even buying things, he was just trying things on, and then having a sex act, and go, what yeah. was I think? I know, yeah. I just look back thinking, I was clueless, and I can see why I was clueless, and I can yes. see how he played it, and then finally, her face, and her horror, made me realise, something was, now I, I, years later, I thought of this, and realised, that was autogynophilia, and I had no idea, in yeah, spades. there's there's definitely a predatory nature. Oh yeah, to what you're describing. Oh yeah, it was horrible. It was a horrible part of the whole thing. It was horrible. Just so you know, you can curse on this podcast. Oh, thank you. you <laughs> yeah, where I thought you wanted to let loose and you held I back. I did. So feel free. <laughs> well spotted. Just, just putting that out there. Um, okay, as someone who has experienced legitimate uh, gender dysphoria. Um, and somebody who's spent a lot of time around people who are dealing with different aspects of this. I'm just going to put it bluntly. Do you think it's possible to be born in the wrong body? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I think, you know, you can't be born in the wrong head. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what, what what are these bodies I could have been born in? You know what I mean? You're born in your body and as your body. And when my body dies, I will die. So I, 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 I don't think I can differentiate me from my body. I am my body. I can make it bigger and make it smaller. I can do things to it. But I am my body, if you follow me. And sure. so there isn't an option. Um, and I think it's a very, very good description of a feeling but it's not an actual tangible event mm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. It should have been always seen as an analogy. It's a metaphor for how people feel. That's what, what it should have been seen as. But, sure. you know. Do you think that the, um, the definition of gender dysphoria has changed? Well, I think the definition of gender dysphoria is a joke in the DSM these days. The DSM hasn't covered itself in glory. It's the Diagnostic Statistics Manual for Psychotherapists. And the most ridiculous conditions are going in there, like, you know, shyness and extreme shyness and all that sort of stuff, pathological avoidance. Now, I don't know them, and I'm not saying these conditions aren't very difficult. I know you can be crippled all your life by shyness. I wouldn't underestimate it. It's a devastating feeling. But I think the DSM in general, it's it's... The idea of it was to list kind of symptoms, which was a nice idea, but it's kind of lost its way. When you look up, and I, I urge anybody who's interested in this, up, look up the gender dysphoria for the DSM, and they will just see a list of regressive um, criteria, such as wanting to play with playmates of the opposite sex, wanting to play with toys of the opposite sex, wanting to you know, wear clothes of the opposite sex. It's like, what are you for real? Or what are we in the 1950s? Exactly. Like, it's a joke of a of a criteria list. So I suppose what I would see it as, you know, it's a pervasive feeling within somebody to be the to want to be somebody else, to want to be the opposite sex, and it seems to be very chronic in some people. And I, I think you know that's very interesting psychologically. I don't want to be me. I want to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. Thinking um, that that's better somehow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some people get obsessed with the size of their nose or their eye or their breasts or their genitals. And that's called body dysmorphia. And they can get 
utterly consumed by it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's not the same though because what I had, I, I there was no body part I was thinking of. I just wanted mm. to be a boy, and I couldn't understand why I wasn't a boy, and I should be a boy. I actually think I would have been very good as a boy. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you were actually. <laughs> I was. I was. I was. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you think that this list is growing? In the what is the? I always forget the, the initials for that manual. DSM five. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because um, we're looking for things to treat with pharmaceuticals. I mean, and 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 then insure those people. Yeah, I think the pharmaceutical industry is wagging the 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 dog here. If you follow me, the pharmaceutical <clears throat> industry it's leading the way. It's it's caused so much mayhem. This idea of giving all these remember I was given the analysis of what led to the, the gender thing. One of the things I missed was, by the way, the growth in the pharmaceutical industry, and not only that, the growth in pharmaceuticals for children, and pharmaceuticals psychoactive that would actually make children feel better psychologically. So children mm-hmm. getting medication at ten and twelve. You know, getting antidepressants, getting anti-anxiety, getting Ritalin and stuff like that. And I'm not saying Ritalin's good or bad. What I'm saying is the idea of medicating children arrived in the 90s. With Before that, it was very, very unusual. And then it became much more common. So, of course, gender dysphoria just became another thing to be medicated. Sorry, that's not what you asked. But yeah, the pharmaceutical industry, yeah, they, they have a huge part to play. As well as that, there's just diagnosis creep. You can't do anything without somebody sticking a label on you these days. So the psychological industry, my own industry, has been a disaster, an absolute disaster. I think it's completely lost its way, sadly, but it really has. Is the pharmaceutical industry, uh, is it like that in Ireland too? Like it, commercials all over the TV, uh, uh, uh them, um, what is the word I'm trying to look for? Supporting politicians with lots of contributions, sponsoring. Well, sure. um, no, uh, we wouldn't have ads for anything on the TV or anything. We'd be horrified. Okay. And America's well known for having them. Oh my but God, yes. We're about, I often think we're just 10 years behind. I think what we are shocked at from America, we generally see in Ireland 10 years later. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And it's so shocking sure. when you hear these stories from America. And I'm like, well, everything else since I've been a little kid 10 years later came to us and we weren't so shocked. So, you know what I mean? I, I think it's probably on the way. But I'm hoping that the extraordinary emphasis on all this medication is going so medication is going so badly. I'm hoping there'll be a backlash. I'm hoping people will just say this isn't right. But let's see. Yeah, and for for anxiety and depression and all these things, these are just a part of human existence. Like, there's no way to take a pill out of the toughness of life sometimes. Yeah. Like, sometimes you just have to face it, deal with it. It sucks. You have to get through it. But that's the only way to to overcome it is to, to face it and deal with it. I think that's why I'm so upset with my own industry because there's this kind of these kids are often over therapized you know the kids Mm -hmm. that i see and hear about and not only that they are um they're sure that there's these golden people leaving leading these golden lives and they're happy Mm -hmm. and that's the majority of people and they've got something wrong with them because they're not happy and they're filled with insecurity and angst and my job often as a therapist is to explain no 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 there's no golden people leaving golden lives most of us are filled with angst and worries and we wake up in the morning and we think about this and then we have moments of joy and then we get a kind of handle on this thing but then some other issue comes in. That's the human condition. And the more, this idea that there's this great life out there that everybody else is living and they just can't because mm. of their condition, it's really nihilistic because they're kind of real thinking there's something wrong with them. But not only <laughs> that, they're, um, how would I say it? They're leading them to believe in a false promise that it just isn't true. Yeah. Which is the, the another facade that social media offers people, too, is they can just put that one little snapshot where things were cohesive and made sense in that one moment and then go back to the chaos of their lives. But to everybody who's seeing those things, it makes it gives the impression that... And they all have it together. Their lives are just running smoothly. There's no bumps or speed bumps or potholes or anything like that. It's very deceiving, especially yeah. for, for kids. And very depressing because they think, 
everybody else has got to figure it out. What's wrong with me? And then somebody would say, well, that's your condition. And they'll think, oh, my God, if only I didn't have this condition, I could be happy because everybody else is. And I'm like, none of this is true. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the thing that I have, the, the term I've coined is the makes me feel culture oh. that we live in. So we have co-opted our, our, our emotional state to others. So if you uh, say something that I don't agree with, then you, my state is based on how you perceive me and how, and how we interact. So I will say, well, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So uh, now I'm relying on you for my state. So if I want to be happy, you have to make me happy. But I think that's the problem is that there's such a, a transient nature to emotional states that, yes, they're valid for you in that moment, but they're not static. And, and where you are at three is not necessarily where you're going to be at 30 or at 15 or at any, any uh, place along that trajectory. So I think that's the thing that I'm not hearing. I'm going into the field of psychotherapy, but that's one of the things that I'm not hearing is this is not permanent. Yeah. So the way you're feeling right now may not be the way you feel like in a year or five years or 10. So I think that's the thing that we're not teaching kids is resilience and understanding that these are temporary uh, feelings that you have, I'll be them valuable and valid, but that's, that doesn't mean this is always the way it's going to be. I couldn't agree more. I think resilience is, 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 is key and it's been lost. You know, the fragile generation, they're, they're not happier as a result of being coddled, you know. Um, I've just read like John Haidt's new book, The Anxi Anxious Generation. I, I got a review copy and it's, it's frightening mm -hmm. how much he had written, you know, The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. And now it's a few years later and he's called call it The Anxious Generation. And these kids, they're not, they're not doing well. All this kind of looking after them and allowing them the kind of the, the power of it. And I think there's an awful lot of power in being a victim. Do you remember I talked about queer theory and, you know, mm -hmm. you know the kind of the dynamics of somebody is a pr an oppressor and somebody's a victim. Mm -hmm. And there's been this elevated power for somebody in their victimhood. How you make me feel, like you make me feel uncomfortable. Not only is the onus on the per like you, Hunter, are making me feel uncomfortable. Not only am I kind of accusing you, but I'm I'm also centering myself as the, the main event here. Yeah. And your job is to make me feel better. It's, mm -hmm. it's incredibly demanding. And um, we, we really need to kind of, like being uncomfortable is part of the human condition. And <laughs> we really need to start, like we've really lost our way. I think the psychology has so lost its way. I, I, I'm very sad about it. I'm very sad about what's what's going on. I think there's an awful lot of really needlessly unhappy people being bred in this kind of mentality.